like it. All right, welcome back. <clears throat> During the lunch break, there, I was trying to figure out what exactly we need to do. We have covered a fair amount of content. You know, we've also got a fair amount of content online. It's in sort of a distributive sense. You know, the registry breaks everything down by live in, you know, actually in classroom from this blended standpoint. Things that are virtual instructor-led training, like this presentation and the ones this morning and the others that we've done, can be counted as a classroom. Because they, they don't like to give a lot of credit out for distributive stuff. Distributive training is like stuff that was recorded and has been on the shelf for a few years and you take it whenever and consume the information, maybe take a quiz on it or whatever. This is considered a classroom thing, so we can kind of kind of get around that. <clears throat> it's not cheating per se, it's just one of the ways they've uh, identified as a way to get the education you need without actually going to class. Because of everybody's busy lives these days, let me just plug in my. So I think between what we've done in the classroom, one down day one, what we'll do in classroom tomorrow, and technically day six, uh, what we've done virtual and instructor led type stuff, plus the distributive things we can count, the reading assignments, and all the stuff that are going along, we're about done with this. I think I'm going to uh, uh, obviously do one more presentation this way, and then we'll probably be done for the day. There's the pharmacology <coughs> principles of pharmacology part two, and another ventilation lecture I uploaded this morning. Those are there as of today, uh, in addition to the two presentations that we streamed earlier, and then what we have tomorrow. So we're getting close to being done. So this is on infectious disease, uh, awareness, assessment, and management of things. <coughs> no, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. I think our book says we need to spend 30 minutes on this. Let me double check that. Good old registry NCCP 16 book. Now you can hear me probably and can't see me. Well, maybe a better way of doing that. I'm sure it's just 30 minutes. So <clears throat> this is going to talk about bloodborne pathogen, airborne pathogen, that sort of thing. Everybody's seen this before. Again, it's very pressure. Anatomy, physiology, epidemiology, pathophysiology, psychosocial impact of these diseases that we'll discuss somewhat. And HIV, hepatitis, pneumonia, meningococcal meningitis, and tuberculosis, tetanus, viral diseases, STDs, gastroenteritis, fungal and rabies, scabies, lice, Lyme. Communicable disease is defined as the infectious disease that can be passed from one person to the other. So everybody knows that. We have certain responsibilities. There's public health agencies that really monitor this stuff for us. And I don't want to offend anybody, but the communication between them and EMS is probably, could certainly be improved. But anyway, uh, there's certainly, uh, I think, things there that could be improved. But then you're also keeping in mind patient confidentiality and HIPAA kind of gets in the way sometimes too. Uh, OSHA, CDC are two agencies listed there. Um, and then your local health department and such. The Ryan White Care Act of 1992, I believe it was, requires medical facilities to notify emergency personnel of transmitted diseases involving patients they transported. Um, the hospitals have been way better about that lately. Their infection control people are really good about calling our infection control officers it should be calling your infection control officers at the other agencies I'm speaking to out there and to notify them so they can cross-reference the patient name, whatever data they give them to the crew that transported that patient so that information can be passed on. This has been a law for a long time and it took a little while for some, some entities, some healthcare institutions to really actually follow it, right? Uh, state and local health departments responsible for protecting the public from disease. So they are supposed to monitor 
all of these things. And uh, if you, you're a person that has one of these diseases, you're supposed to tell them that. They're, you're supposed to report uh, any kind of infectious communicable disease to the health department. In some cases, the health care providers do that for you. But, uh, obligation to protect patients from health care associated infections. So essentially, if you're infected or even if you have a, a viral cold sort of thing, that perhaps is uh, something you need to protect your patients from. Comply with all the work restrictions, keep the ambulance and equipment disinfected. You know, that's a difficult thing to do sometimes, but at least an attempt is made to uh, keep the, uh, the, the services, the patient care area clean. You know, years ago, this conversation we had years ago, they, this situation was a little different. We had things we actually had to wash, an autoclave, and nowadays with all of our disposable stuff, it wasn't that long ago we had to wash our laryngoscope blades. And that was always a, a challenge, it seemed, but nowadays with what, uh, all everything being disposable, I remember the day when we had to take our BBM bags up to the hospital and have them autoclaved. We didn't have disposable BBMs. So that has really solved a lot of those problems. Uh, the general cleaning routine, strip all the linens. This is pretty basic stuff. Wash the contaminated areas, disinfect all the non-disposable stuff, germicidal, vir viral cidal, type, uh, type of solution, whatever approved solution drapes and carries. Uh, contain any spillage, clean with the germicidal, viral cidal solution written policy for cleaning and cleaning should focus on high touch items. Did anyone, I won't probably get much feedback, but did anyone go to the presentation on infectious disease out there at Guardians? I wanted to go but I missed it. But there's uh, some of our colleagues over at Quapa and if any of you are listening uh, would love some feedback but I know Chris over there is a, has kind of got a, a passion for knowing what kind of germs or perhaps around the workplace at the stations and on the ambulances. So he has, I can't remember her name, he has a friend that works in the, in a lab somewhere and she's real good to come out and do swabs and stuff of steering wheels and phones and different pieces of equipment in the ambulance and the stations and the remote control and some of those things. You'd be surprised what kind of things are, are uh, just full of different virus and bacteria that you wouldn't even expect. I don't know how many different people have used this remote control, but it's probably interesting to find out. And the things you would expect to be nasty are not necessarily because they get cleaned. Uh, diseases that can be transmitted from one person to another, again, this communicable disease definition depends on the dose, the virulence, mode of entry, health status of the host. So it depends on how much of the viral load you come in contact with and how you come in contact with it, the mode of entry how strong that virus is at that time, it's virulence, it's virulence, and your overall health status too. So how healthy are you? We had a conversation over lunch about prebiotics and probiotics and stuff like that and how the gut health can have a lot to do with it caused by pathogenic microorganisms. So <clears throat> these are all the things that have to do with how the transmission of a communicable disease Several mechanisms like uh, direct and indirect contact. Actually touching someone, some body substance, some body fluid. The droplet transmission likely through mist or a spray of blood or spit, that sort of thing in, in droplets. Uh, airborne transmission of viral bacterial loads, viral loads that are being transmitted through the air through a person's breath. Vector would be a bug, vector borne, something like a mosquito. Um, three other additional categories. So your standard precautions, I think everybody probably is pretty good about wearing gloves and I've said this I don't know how many times, but gloves are so common no one thinks about them too much anymore. But what we do forget about is eye protection, which would certainly protect you from the droplet thing. Respiratory protection protects you from the airborne stuff. I mean, we did tend to dismiss that a lot of time because it isn't necessarily easy to work in those things. If you're not wearing glasses all the time, to wear some kind of safety glass that invariably will fog is an issue. I mean, it's hard to perform your job function in something you can't see through. Uh, it's hard to breathe through most uh, type of uh, masks, so a lot of people don't wear those on a general routine basis, and that makes total sense, but it's uh, a little bit. <coughs> 
thought my voice just left me. It may be a quicker presentation than I thought. <clears throat> Hello? Sorry. <clears throat> All right, so this chart is probably going to be difficult to see. Feedback back there, how's this chart to see? This is the uh, recommended personal protective equipment for certain job tasks. And it's even blurry as I stand right here live looking at it, so it may be difficult to see for any of you. This is certainly out of, obviously out of the textbook, but this talks about disposable gloves, gown, mask, and protective eyewear, the four basic things that make up your personal protective equipment or your PPE for medical calls. Anything, <clears throat> yes, 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 all the way across the board for bleeding control and spurting blood. Well, that makes sense. Clear down to giving a, giving an injection, which doesn't really require anything. It's all about having contact with the potentially infectious material. And hygiene, you'll see that, I'm sure, on a test question, maybe the one you've already seen before, and you've read an article on hand hygiene, hand washing amongst the healthcare staff, healthcare, healthcare workers. It is the single most effective way, I think I just spit, sorry. It's the single most effective way to deal with cross-contamination of certain diseases, uh, communicable and otherwise. But uh, hand hygiene, very important. Uh, Antimicrobial alcohol-based foams are great. Cover open cut sores with a dressing. Uh, alcohol-based things, I don't know about everybody. Any feedback from anybody out there or even in the room, but alcohol-based things dries my hands out so bad that my skin becomes broken and basically non-intact and would probably be, for me at least, a, an entry mode, a mode of entry of some sort of pathogen. So I have occasionally have to use them, but uh, I try not to, and <laughs> this is that time of year where the air is dry anyway, except for today, sort of, but alcohol-based things will dry your skin, and, you know, they certainly have a, a place and a presence uh, in, our, in our world as a way to clean your hands, but just take care of your hands after having to do that. If running soap and water isn't available, that may be your only option. Just keep in mind, and all of you know how your hands are, not telling you anything you don't already know. Um, I get these little things on my thumbs all the time, or my fingers, little dry spots, little hangnails basically. And I cover them with super glue on occasion just to make sure they're covered because band-aids never stink. Should include gloves, eyewear, gowns, surgical mask, N95, P100 masks, the non-particulate, uh, non-petroleum mask that most of us would refer to as a HEPA mask, the N95, and the petroleum. Uh, 100 or the P100 respirators, which we don't typically see too much in our industry. Ooh, that's got a big space there. And there's another again talking about the uh, hand washing foam or gel. This bottom bolt's important because it's now been like 18 years ago that we were, everybody was supposed to, I think it was 2002, so maybe not 18 years ago, but do the math for me. Needle safe or needleless devices. So once upon a time, of course, we had IV catheters that were just not, not safe kept. Uh, now, you know, for a long, long time, there's been different types of safe needle devices uh, to address that issue right there. So everybody by 2002, 16, 17 years ago, was supposed to have had that taken care of. Uh, particulate respirator, um, filters, particulates or particles that come through the mask. If respirators are on an EMS vehicle, a full respiratory protection program must be in place. So, you know, we don't typically see a lot of that. <clears throat> I remember a few years ago, like it was 2014, when we had the Ebola uh, scare, the little uh, half a dozen or so people in the United States that actually contracted Ebola. There were, and there still are, specialized teams and specialized vehicles that, in basically response to that deal in 2014, uh, are, are equipped and staffed and I have a whole room full of all the stuff we bought in there that's probably going out of date and sitting in dry rot because we bought it, never really needed it, so it's hard to figure out where exactly to put it, a lot of it ended up in storage and it's still sitting in there. But we never really put a true respiratory protection program in place except for, you know, at least for us here locally, you're supposed to get fitted when you get hired. You might as well have been before that. 
<coughs> anyway, gloves, of course, are very commonly used. Uh, nowadays, we use mostly a nitro glove, not a latex. Protective eyewear, you can probably see that there, right? The uh, standard paper surgical masks with the little uh, visor shield thing attached. It's <coughs> handy. It covers, covers your mouth, nose, and eyes in one garment, which is pretty handy. Not super, super effective, but certainly uh, convenient and uh, fairly efficient, just not super effective. That's that needle safe program I talked about, and I'm fairly certain that was in 2002 that was supposed to be. But that's a prevention act. It was supposed to be followed, actually, as a regulation. So removal of PPE <coughs> is, the only, is the only effective removal process or to be employed. That was a big deal. Also about the Ebola thing, you know, there was, I honestly can't tell you, I've read the after action reports, but, you know, there was stuff even in the news that some of them <coughs> may have been transmitted because they did not have proper training to take the stuff off, right? was plenty of CDC guidance on that stuff back then for the Ebola thing, but there was even some contradiction on in, in their articles. So I think everybody knows to doff their gear, their, doff their uh, personal protective equipment during the process for it. And we're not going to go super deep into that right now because it is, there are different ways of doing it. There are different kinds of equipment that people wear. Gloves are pretty standard. The, Gowns are fairly standard, but they're, they're full gowns or aprons. There's full body suits and everything. And your Tyvek suits and such. And you're supposed to have an infection control officer at your agency. Um, you should know who that is, and not that important, I guess. But if you have an on on the job type of infection or exposure, you need to go and know who to talk to. At least initially, it'd be your initial upline, the supervisor, and then they'll know who to speak to. But and then that's usually the person the hospitals know of also that call and talk to them when they have a, a case to report through the line, uh, the Ryan White Act. That <coughs> acts as a liaison between the agencies of public health and hospital and the staff at the agency. Uh, it keeps up on all the post exposure paperwork and the documentation that go along with that. Ensure proper treatment is received. Obviously, uh, we aren't considering ourselves experts in this arena. So we, you know, identify that something's happened, and we send the, the person off somewhere else. Let them take care of it. Occupa occupational medicine folks. Exposure to bloodborne pathogens, the one that most of us are probably the most concerned about, through a contaminated needle stick injury blood or otherwise potentially infectious material as OPIM uh, get into the eye, nose, or mouth. That's with an object covered with blood or OPIM, otherwise infectious, otherwise potentially infectious material. Airborne and droplet transmittable disease, now again they'll cover that with you. This is the post exposure follow up stuff. The source individual should be tested for. So if you have an exposure, sometimes the definition of an exposure is the hardest part to figure out first, but once that's been established, then there's a fairly well regimented prescribed procedure on how to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> hopefully the, the, the individual at uh, in question uh, is, will, is willing to submit to those sort of tests, those blood tests. They, uh, I guess they do have the, the option to refuse that, as I recall have to submit and agree that their blood be tested for those things. And if that's the case, then the, the responder in this situation gets treated prophylactically. And there's a possibility you can't ask them that. And then there's the unconscious person that gets basically um, an implied consent. Vaccines, probably everybody that can hear me now has had their vaccines. Um, the Hep B vaccine in particular, and then the other vaccines most of us had as a child and may continue to get some of those updates every once in a while. Uh, and then the flu vaccine is always debatable, it seems, every year. Is it effective, not effective? Does the agency require it, not require it, pay for it, not pay for it, all that jazz? Um, I think I just I was told just recently most hospitals still require it. Um, 
which makes sense, but not everybody does that. And then the tetanus are for every 10 years, so you should have the tetanus done every every 10 years. Once you get a cut, then they'll probably update it then. Is it, okay, five years, yeah. Uh, you don't want lockjaw, I guess. Uh, every agency is supposed to have a post-exposure control plan, and in some cases, that's all that's supposed to be in there, the components of that. And then again, a lot of times, it's sort of a handoff to an agency better versed in that sort of thing, and let them make sure all those dots are I's are dotted and T's crossed. Contaminated, infected, and carrier person who have disease but are not ill. Uh, the infected folks. Uh, I mean, these are department responsibilities, sorry. Contaminate an object that has microorganisms on it, and infected has microorganisms that produce an illness, and then those that are carriers that have a disease but are not ill. So one example of that is some people have hep P and are not necessarily showing any symptoms. And of course, there are HIV positive that don't necessarily have symptoms, so they're not actually sick with that disease. Patient assessment is a scene size up as always, take precautions, depending on kind of what you see, what you your gut may tell you. You know, is it a really, uh, is it glove worthy or is it full body condom type worthy? So, obtain your history as always, OPQRSD a sample. General management principles, uh, focus first on the life threatening conditions, be empathetic. Uh, physician and uh, Patient is comfortable, treat for dehydration is indicated. That's all pretty basic stuff. Dispose of your sharps as usual. Follow your agency's exposure control plan. Uh, properly discard any disposable supplies and linens. Uh, we have around our places, probably common in most, the red boxes for biohazard trash. Uh, basically, all the trash that comes off your ambulance should be just considered biohazard, unless it's your Jimmy John's cup or whatever. That's not necessarily. Um, that, to get rid of that, to dispose of that stuff is pricey and it all gets mostly incinerated. Uh, so there are certainly the, the uh, carriers that come and take this stuff, are, they, you know, they charge a fair amount. So there's some, some cost involved in disposing of that trash properly. Chain of infection, uh, study of infectious disease considers the Age, certain genetic factors, income levels, ethnic groups. This, these are the infected population, basically, and these are the factors that go into that um, study of infectious disease and all those things that are considered. Other factors that would be a risk of infection would include the type of organism. This was actually mentioned earlier in the slides in one of the um, early uh, uh, objective slides. The type of organism, the dose, and the virulence, how strong it is, and the mode of entry. And also there's the host resistance. So in, in this conversation, you, how resistant to, med, uh, to these infectious diseases are you. Some have a natural resistance, some have a, a born in resistance, some have a passive. Then there's the active resistance from your uh, uh, vaccines. There's another chart that may be hard to read. I'm not sure it's that important, but we'll talk a little bit here about Comparison of selected pathogenic organisms, the life cycle, bacteria and viruses. Bacteria is a little stronger. It um, produced outside the human cell in an environment characterized by the appropriate temperature and nutrients. And viruses much smaller than bacteria can multiply only inside a host, die when exposed to the environment. So bacteria are the ones that probably get us more often than not, but viruses are usually a little worse if you get them because they've actually reproduced inside you, most likely. Um, fungi, similar to bacteria in that they can grow rapidly in the presence of nutrients and organic material, so they can grow outside of a human host. And then parasites live in or on another living creature. Uh, there's viruses like HIV, it dies when exposed to the environment. It doesn't like um, cold air, doesn't like UV light, it will not survive very long in those environments on surfaces, that sort of thing. Although 
hepatitis is a little hardier uh, virus and it will last a little longer in those blood droplets that may land on the cot or on the floor, that sort of thing. So it's kind of hard to see when it's probably so I'm just going to walk past that one. Infection in sepsis, the body's overreaction to an infection or virus can progress into shock. And of course, septic shock is a medical emergency. It requires rapid transport or treatment to prevent tissue damage. We're going to tell you in depth. The ones that are mostly at risk are the very old and very young. Anyone with a compromised immune system or diabetes. Uh, the assessment there is all your signs and symptoms. As always, quick sepsis related organ failure assessment or the Q-SOPA, uh, which I've seen before but I haven't ever really talked much about. So it's a uh, quick sepsis rapid scoring system that can be used to identify a patient who have an infection and may be at risk from dying from se sepsis. Anyone out there are hospital based, the hospital is using the Q-SOPA thing to determine the inpatient. Um, it's, it's a big deal in hospitals because sepsis can get very expensive. These patients, if they get sicker, they end up staying in the ICU and get, get, quite, get expensive. And, uh, you can definitely, some of these things can be prevented. And that's one way to do it. Management, pulse oximetry, all your typical management tools. Um, consult with medical direction in regard to more fluids versus vasopressing agents. Transport to the closest appropriate facility. Again, that's thing that's everywhere. Meningitis is the uh, inflammation of the meninges around the brain. There's the bacterial, which is communicable, and viral, non communicable. Meningococcal meningitis most often involved in the epidemic outbreaks. So that's the one that we run into. And we had an issue in the, in the local area a while back with uh, you know college age kids. It was the bacterial kind. Transmission is direct contact with the nasal pharyngeal secretions. And <clears throat> in reading on this sort of thing years ago, the the any Idiocy of this one is the uh, is this would affect a population that you might be willing to do mouth to mouth ventilation on if they were in a you know a cardiac arrest state. Problem is they may be in a cardiac arrest state because of meningitis and that and that infection in around the brain. And if you did mouth to mouth on that population because most of us in this industry would do so probably on a child, um, that may be cross contamination right there because it's. Nasal pharyngeal secretions, possibly in the mouth and stuff, they're in mouth to mouth uh, ventilation. So that's another reason to consider uh, compression only CPR. Incubation period, two to 10 days. Assessment is they're going to have a fever, they're going to have that nuchal rigidity where they can't take their chin down to their chest, and so a stiff neck. All right. Uh, twice on mask. to do those things, but it's likely that the uh, treatment there is some kind of antibiotic. Pathophysiology of the seasonal flu is a droplet transmitted, so it's just everywhere. It's why people who are sick are highly suggested to stay home um, and away from other people. Incubation periods, one to four days, to the, and then it's uh, communicable from day before symptoms five days after onset so that's the whole hand washing thing that I had some you need a signature we're live hang on everybody take a break
All right, I'm back. I think we've seen a lot about the flu over the years. The flu, this is the poster I was looking for. This is uh, fight the flu, wash your hands. I think we've heard that somewhere. Use antibacterial hand sanitizers and soap. Stay home if you have a fever. You can get in on that, okay? Probably everybody has seen this. This is the sort of thing you would have been posted around stations, hospitals, break rooms, that sort of thing. Um, we're in the flu season now, and it was a fairly mild flu season from what I know, but it's starting in again, so it's a little bit later start right now. There may be someone out there that can uh, clarify or contradict that, and that's fine. I just don't recall hearing a lot about a bad flu season this particular go around until just recently. Uh, signs, symptoms may include fever, headache, muscle pain. Probably everybody has had the flu at one point, so they understand what flu is all about. Uh, place a mask on the patient if they can tolerate that. If that's great if they can, because it's about the stuff that they're exhaling as they breathe. Uh, pertussis, the cough produced uh, caused by the bacterium Mordadella pertussis. Now, there's been an increase in the whooping cough or pertussis over the last few years, uh, somewhat due to lack of vaccinations in certain populations, certain parts of the country. But uh, has a they'll have a fever, they'll present with fever, thick nasal secretion, cough, not be able to breathe very well because of the coughing. They'll have uh, lots of dis uh, discharge and difficulty with their airway getting air through there. Uh, Mask the patient is good. Probably an oxygen mask would be appropriate also to help some supplemental O2 for them. Good hand washing and just good uh, good self-care afterwards. Mumps transmitted through droplets of direct contact with saliva and respiratory secretions. So if you know they got mumps, avoid you know suctioning and avoid their you know their airway stuff. If you don't know, it's probably good that if you ever have to get down close and suction someone who just don't know their medical history it's a good idea and it's never done I know because suctioning is, so, is one of those things you do in an in a instant in a heartbeat because it has to be done and we don't think about putting protection on ourselves but anytime you can think about that you now it's droplets uh, from and direct contact with saliva or respiratory secretions so I don't know anyone out there who likes I'm not going to say that I have a fever, headache, muscle aches, swelling of salivary glands, provide supportive care. <clears throat> Mumps is uh, placed on work restriction for about three weeks if they end up with mumps. Rubella, caused by the, uh, a virus, incubation period is rather long. This one doesn't come up very often, so we'll move past it very quickly here. It's a generally a mild disease. Include a headache, mild pink eyes, swollen lip nodes, cough, runny nose. Tuberculosis, you know, we uh, this was a deal for probably 20 some years ago. Everyone had to have N95 fit testing and wear N95 masks all the time. And that was uh, always became a bit of an issue. Born in Asia or Africa, we had uh, persons at risk. I'm sorry. Incarcerated or homeless because of the tight quarters and the sharing of a lot of things. Anyone immunocompromised and in long term care, just uh, again, that sort of facility type of environment or uh, residential uh, institutional type of people. Yeah, TB has been around. It's, uh, there's multi drug resistant and extensively drug resistant types of TB2. Bacterium is resistant to two or more first line antibiotics or drugs. Extensively drug resistant to bacterium is resistant to the two first oral medications and the two first injectable kinds. So, TB can be kind of nasty and hard to treat. Transmission by airborne particles, the incubation periods four to 12 weeks when active lesion develops in the lungs. So, they may have TB or TB in their history, but if they're not actively sick with it right now, then they're not necessarily communicable and able to give that to someone else. So this is a little bit about the virulence of the drug or of the uh, actual uh, infection itself. Early infection affected by a skin test. So 
Well, if everyone does those uh, TB skin tests, or at least, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, right. So. Characterized by night sweats, fatigue, hemoptopus, uh, hoarseness, and uh, chest pain. Hemoptysis, I said that wrong. Place a surgical mask on the patient because this that will protect you from what they are exhaling, the droplets they exhale when they breathe out when they exhale. Report that potential exposure to the uh, direct incident um, to the infection control officer. Clean the vehicle following transport. <coughs> Chicken pox or the varicella zoster. There goes my voice again. One goes this time. Let me. Itchy, fluid filled vesicles transmitted by. I mean, if you haven't had chicken pox, you know what chicken pox is, then leave me a note. <coughs> That's how it looks like, if you can see that, probably not too well. Uh, common in children, certainly, uh, younger kids, and then if adults get this, it's usually harder to <coughs> get over and deal with, and then it may lead even to. Of shingles, same as the virus. Measles, highly communicable and transmitted by airborne aerosolized droplets. So, fever, conjunctivitis, uh, followed by cough, blotchy rash, coplet sign uh, spots. Oops. Rash management provides supportive care. Only certain protection is immunity. Anyone who has had measles and who received live vaccine should be immune. So that's part of your, uh, part, probably part of your vaccination that you had to have for school, right? Mono, caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. In a relatively long incubation period, it's you know the one transmitted by saliva, the kissing disease. Um, and the prolonged communicable period. So uh, these people are often the right word isn't quarantined, but certainly isolated. They're not really supposed to be around people for that time frame there. There's generally a, a once it's been established, they can kind of go back and see, well, we've had it for two or three weeks, so you only need to stay away from people for another couple of weeks. So you can tell by the viral load how long you probably have had it. And at that point, you've already been around people probably. So would be uh, sore throat, swollen lymph glands, malaise, headache, muscle pain. Gloves, good hand washing, no special cleaning solutions are necessary for this one. Gonorrhea, sexually transmitted disease, remains communicable for months if not treated. Uh, male signs, there's dust or uh, pus dis containing discharge from urethra. Same thing, inflammation of the urethra, cervix, and probably inflammatory disease. Management. Gloves, don't touch it. Syphilis, you know the whole thing, cold, wet, and not yours, don't touch it thing. Warm, wet, not yours, don't touch it. Not mine, don't touch it, that sort of thing. Syphilis, sort of the same sort of thing. Uh, STD, <coughs> incubation period, 10 days to three months. Um, again, basically stay away from it. Gloves, good hand washing, fill the herpes. Same thing. I think we've covered that. That's disgusting. I'm not even sure what that is, to be honest. I don't know that I care. Why did they put a picture in for that? One? Uh, management. <laughs> there is no cure for genital herpes. That was really gross. Chlamydia. We get another STD. Transmission through sexual contact. Incubation periods a little shorter than some. Um, and communicable period is actually unknown for the CLAP. Uh, inflammation. Uh, those urethra epidemics and cervix, fallopian tubes, discharge and prevalence are common. Treated with antibiotics. Use gloves and good hand washing. Scabies, transmission, uh, skin to skin contact. So these are uh, communicable mites and eggs are destroyed. Until are, communicable until mites and eggs are destroyed. So that's fix it, how you would uh, treat scabies. Uh, there's some scabies there, kind of hard to see. But the rash, intense itching, sores from scratching would be a thing. So, 
you run into people, patients, people you don't know very well all the time. You have different sores on them, you don't know why. But <clears throat> that doesn't mean they have scabies. It just means, you know, be aware, look for those things. Uh, again, uh, it can be prevented by wearing gloves and good hand hygiene, good hand washing, and routine cleaning procedures of the vehicle and your linens. Most linens, I think, are disposable now, with the exception of the blankets, basically. Blankets are not really a good disposable blanket, but the uh, bath blankets that we never steal from the hospitals. We don't borrow for an extended period of time either, but we <coughs> maybe we do. Lice. Knows a little bit about lice. If they've ever had kids in school and there's a potential lice scare, doesn't mean I don't mean that they've had them. It just means that everyone probably has seen or been around lice and understands that. Uh, STDs, general you know, genital warts, and the human papilloma virus, other STDs and related conditions. Dermophyte infections. Uh, fungal infections of the skin are uh, usually superficial. Again, that's something probably to avoid or not touch without gloves. Elements uh, hookworm and pinworm, bed bugs. We have some issues with some big for everybody, but we have some things we can sort of address that with. We did the, I'll call them the bug bombs, the fogging machines. <coughs> that was. Somewhat successful. We had issues with the noxious odor that thing caused, and then we have uh, considered now a uh, UV light that will destroy those too. And that's coming soon. If you haven't, anybody for Newton County Ambulance District, we're using some UV lights this year, so we got those on the way. Hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver produced by the virus. There are these five different forms now of it. it. used to be basically just A and B. A is a fecal oral kind. That's why every restaurant says all employees must wash their hands before returning to work. Hepatitis B is what you've likely been uh, vaccinated for. There's the jaundiced skin, the yellow eyes. This gentleman, my goodness. Uh, the jaundice and the sclerera. Management basically is a vaccine. There is no cure once you have it. Uh, you may carry it around for a while, not even have symptoms. But uh, hepatitis C is the one shared by needles, needle stick injuries, or mother to infant. Same as the other hepatitis B uh, viral infections. Uh, symptoms usually are fairly quick onset, six to seven weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought that was going to say days. I had that mixed up. So these are uh, symptoms won't appear for a while. Management though is use gloves, protect yourself. D, a non-hepatitis or non-hepatitis D infection is without hepatitis B. Uh, this incubation period is quite long, infection and stages of the illness are lengthy. Move on past D, HIV, pathophysiology transmitted by blood and other body fluids. A lot of us know about HIV is because we've been, you know, inundated with information about it for a long time. You know, started back in the 80s. There's you know, all kinds of famous people who have gotten that. I mean, information about HIV has been so ever prevalent for most of our lives that it's most everyone knows how or what it is. If the symptoms, you don't necessarily die from HIV itself. You die from HIV-related symptoms or other illnesses that you get from being immunosuppressed and compromised. It is, of course, a bloodborne pathogen, not an airborne, so stay away from blood that's not yours or other potentially infectious material. This is basically what gave, gave way for the uh, safe needle program so that you wouldn't have the risk of uh, needle sticks. And it certainly made a difference. Uh, we still have occasional needle sticks ourselves, but way less than we used to. It used to be a couple per year, and now there's, it's almost non existent. Needle sticks we get now are from an injectable thing, and it's not a dirty needle necessarily. Uh, Ebola, we talked about Ebola a little while ago, but not in great depth. But uh, incubation period is usually one in 21 days. Anyone who's traveled to Western Africa would be suspicious if they're ill and have traveled. 
intense weakness, fever, pain, aches, sore throat. And they will often experience a profuse diarrhea and vomiting. Usually they eventually will die from impaired kidney and liver function, dysfunction. Important treatment, uh, protect yourself, don't get ill also, cover up everything. This is the one where if you suspect that, <clears throat> probably stop everything and uh, consider a different level of PPE. These are not going to be emergent transports and risk the infection of others. When we had these issues four years ago, we developed certain approaches to the whole thing where if you thought they were uh, ill with Ebola, you almost quarantined everybody right there until the proper team could arrive to better transport, care for, uh, specially equipped <coughs> crew and, and vehicle to transport them to a a medical facility also equipped and, and, and trained and ready to receive them. The norovirus can be transmitted by person from person to person. <clears throat> this is the one that is, I believe, is also called the cruise ship virus. It seems to uh, be transmitted by these things that are common in some of those arrangements where there's lots of people in a fairly small space keeping the areas clean and disinfected can be a challenge. Uh, management, <clears throat> wear gloves, practice good hand washing. Hep A is the fecal to oral thing. Someone's sick, you know, but they don't wash their hands and end up going to prepare your lunch and then bam. And there's two phases there. The assessment uh, is phase one, the fatigue phase two is jaundice from Hep A, good hand washing. Hep E, vector borne ones that are transmitted by ticks and mosquitoes. West Nile is one of them. We had a big awareness about West Nile a few years ago, but I haven't heard anything about it in a while now. It causes uh, meningitis because they get a fever, headache, body rash, swollen lymph nodes. It causes a, a encephalopathy. Uh, management using safe needles, uh, notify the uh, director of uh, infection control. Dingu fever. Uh, go ahead and pass through that one. I wanted to get through this a little quicker than we have so far. It causes a hemorrhagic fever, which may bleed, which makes sense. I don't remember how to pronounce that one, but the chicken and fever. Does it sound like anything I want? Zika. This has been a big deal recently, but in the mosquito borne, vector borne deal. <coughs> Transmitted by a bite of a mosquito and sexually transmitted. Correlation between Zika and the uh, Guillaume Barre syndrome uh, present in the urine, saliva, and semen. Incubation period three to 14 days. The symptoms will be the fever, rash, joint pain, conjunctivitis, and muscle pain with a headache. Um, keeping up to date on where Zika is known to be is was sort of ever present in our weekly updates from CDC, but I haven't seen one now in over a year probably. I know there was parts of Florida and some even in Texas that were known Zika areas, but I haven't seen that updated now in a while. Basically management here is basically supportive care, rest, fluids, analgesics, antipyretics, and notify the infection control. Tick-borne or Lyme disease. Typically I, <clears throat> characterized by that target type uh, rash with the tick bite in the middle and then there's a white blotchy area and then the red ring. They will have uh, uh, right there, uh, flu like symptoms, arthritis, pain in the joints. Management of the tick bites wearing long sleeve uh, pants and shirts when you're outside, particularly while using insecticides because they you know, will run from the insecticides and you may be causing using it anyway, the insecticide is probably because there's a known tick population or something there. So, Rocky Mountain's fever, spotted, what did I just say, fever? <laughs> Sorry, heard my word for the year. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, also uh, uh, transmitted by tick. Fever, headache, abdominal pain, vomiting. Doxycycline is the treatment for up to usually about 30 some days. Hantavirus is found in urine, feces, and saliva of the infected rodents, transmitted by direct contact with rodent waste. <coughs> um, 
incubation period periods about 16 days. Uh, there's two stages of this one: two pulmonary syndrome in stage one, fever, trails, chills, headaches, muscle aches, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, cough, and then it progresses to cough with secretion, shortness of breath, low blood pressure, cardiac insufficiency, and possibly even death. But use standard precautions: clean the vehicle, rabies. Incubation period, signs and symptoms, fever, chills, sore throat. <clears throat> See a lot of similarities in the symptoms that one. It's not uh, knowing that you have something more than just a common cold or flu, maybe. MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, <clears throat> the coronavirus, causes a uh, respiratory illness. Feels my voice again, so this is going to have to wrap that pretty quick. Obtain a travel history if they've been to the Middle East and are sick, which is possible. <clears throat> so glove up and take your precautions. Assess for fever, cough, shortness of breath, and as well as GI disturbances, including nausea, vomiting. Uh, these patients may require ventilation. Uh, Tetanus transmission occurs when spores enter the body through a cut. Or a uh, laceration, puncture, or anything of that nature that penetrates the skin. Tetanus is not transmitted from person to person, so it's not necessarily one of the communicable diseases. The incubation period is 14 days. Uh, signs and symptoms would be at the uh, actual site of uh, painful muscle contractions or rigidity. Abdominal rigidity is a key sign. And intended to treat the wounds and avoid the drainage. Infection with antibiotic resistant organisms. MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, these are antibiotic resistant staph infections. Incubation period is relatively long, 5 to 45 days. Um, the communicable period varies, and it's not listed up there, and I'm not remembering for sure what the communicable period is either. It's, it can be dormant and they still be infected, but dormant and not necessarily communicable. If you don't disturb the wound or whatever and have the MRSA in. Uh, <clears throat> certain uh, severe underlying health conditions are put people at risk. The MRS, or MRSA infections and dwelling catheters, recent hospitalizations, and any recent exposure to vancomycin in the uh, VRE. Assessment, uh, they would have localized skin abscesses, cellulitis, meningitis is possible, weakness and pain, vancomycin resistant enterococci, primarily a uh, healthcare associated infection, susceptible if already ill or immunocompromised, found in urinary tract uh, track, track and bloodstream infections, and be treated with lisinazole. Cause UTIs. Let's see who else is in the Clostridium or C. diff. Uh, spore forming bacteria that causes watery diarrhea. Transmission by contact with surfaces contaminated by that said feces that contain the C. diff. It's all in two or three days. Watery cream, chlorine based solution is good for cleanup. SARS. Transmission by close personal contact, incubation periods about 10 days. Again, their travel history would be part of this. I have a fever over 100, headache, body aches. Management would be proper PPE, notify the infection control, and a 10 day quarantine. Avion flu, which is one that carried by birds. Very contagious in domestic birds themselves, but there's a low risk of transmission to humans. We had this issue locally a few years ago with some of the bird farms, the turkey and chicken bird farms around. So that was wiped out an entire population of birds and having closed down houses and turkey and chicken farms and everything. You know, cause uh, fever, sore throat, cough, etc. Uh, surgical mask on the patient. Again, and the flu shot.
Well, don't worry, brother. Okay. We'll do that's the end of it. <clears throat> All right. One thirty now. And like I said when we started this, when any questions you can? No, that's it. Okay. Is everybody awake? Is anybody still there? Okay. I lost a few. Sorry. That was a pretty boring, uh, boring, dry subject, and is all. <laughs> notifying or noticing the symptoms, notifying the right people to help mitigate the issue, and taking care of yourself. Like I said, looking over everything, what we've done, what we have planned to do tomorrow, and what's out there for you, you can do now with week two reading assignments from actually two weeks ago. Uh, some posted videos this morning on ventilation and uh, pharmacy principles part two is on there so that can be your work for the rest of the afternoon so i believe we are done with live streaming for today so i will see you tomorrow 8 30 at readings mill fire station one for some a trauma day really and the skill stuff all right if you have questions you know how to get a hold of me through remind app or email me or you know call me text me whatever i'll see y'all tomorrow <laughs>